Good morning. I'm Leif Nelson. Thanks for coming to the Data Colada seminar series. It's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Betsy Levy Pollock. In addition to Betsy, we will have a number of great panelists uh, David Yeager, Elizabeth Linos, Edward Chang. It's also possible that Jeff Cohen is going to be joining us. That was certainly his intention, though he is obviously not yet here. Uh, in addition to all those people, we have Joe Simmons and Yuri Simonson, uh, as always, who will be with us as well. For all of you who have done this before, it should be familiar, but if you're new to it, you'll see at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A function. The Q&A function allows you to submit questions or comments that can be seen by all of the panelists and by Betsy. Now, Betsy presumably is gonna to be too busy to read them, but don't worry, we have a chance to read them. And if, if we have a chance, we will interrupt her and potentially voice them. And even if we don't, they're all recorded so I can share them with Betsy after the talk is over. Cool. So with all that being said, uh, Betsy, the, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Thanks for having me. And I'm just delighted to, to be here with, um, with everybody. So um, I wanna talk today about a paper that is really a follow on of um, a prejudice reduction review, a narrative review that I did with Donald Green um, when I was still a graduate student. And so um, what was happening at the time, okay, there we go. What was happening at the time um, we did our initial review is that uh, Don was teaching a, a course called Racial Prejudice and Political Intolerance, and I was his TA. And um, he said to me, you know, I, I like to try to end on a, on a higher note and, and, and to end on um, some ideas for the way forward, because it's, a, it's somewhat of a depressing slog. Um, and I'm always interested in, in updating the, the syllabus. So what are psychologists doing right now in terms of um, uh, uh, moving the field forward? And, and what evidence in particular do we have that could convince a policy skeptic on you know, uh, some way to reduce prejudice, uh, hate speech, uh, discrimination? I said, no problem. The social psychology field was pretty much you know, formed in part around answering questions like this. I'll go get you some studies. We'll plug them into the syllabus. And I actually found it was a lot harder um, a task than I thought it would be, you know, especially to meet those conditions, right? So we want some causal inference, um, we want some behavioral effects, um, and you know, something that that could plausibly work in the world. And so that set off a huge literature search in which we pretty much tried to just hoover up everything that had been done in the social sciences. Thanks, Life. Um, and uh, and thanks now for for being my assistant in advancing. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead and advance. Um, and so uh, these are my my co-authors on on the paper in which we now revisit that initial narrative um, review. Uh, that's Roni Parat um, from Hebrew University. She was my postdoc at the time of doing this. Uh, on the left, uh, um, Chelsea Clark, who is just a rising star. Please watch this space. Who's my graduate student currently? And then there's Don Green, who's my was my mentor, forever mentor, so you can go ahead. This is the original paper on the next slide um, that, uh, that Don and I had produced. Uh, you can keep clicking. Um, in which uh, our conclusion was really that we just didn't know that much um, about causal inference, um, that most of the literature out there, and this was literature that had been, in, done, been done in psychology and in the rest of the social sciences, the biomedical sciences, um, had either been done in a lab um, and often without too many behavioral measures, um, so causal inference there, but no causal, causal inference once you went out into the field. So our call in this paper was for more field experiments, right, um, uh, and, and more measurement of behavior so that we could also start learning about the functional inter interdependence of things like prejudiced attitudes, um, prejudiced emotions, and, and actually then what would people do, you know, right, to, to start convincing these policy skeptics of, of the use and value of um, recommended interventions. So if we go forward, um, we had three questions and you can go, go straight to, into those three, Leif, um, about what's been happening in the last dozen years, what has happened, um, what are the average effects? So this time around, we're not going to do a narrative review. We're just going to restrict the review to um, empirical, um, and uh, um, uh, experimental, um, in experimentally studied interventions. 
And then finally, the third question that we wanted to ask is, can social science answer the public's call to reduce prejudice in the world? And as we were writing this paper um, in 2019 and, and then finishing up in 2020, that call got a lot louder. And so it's been an interesting moment to, to bring this paper out. So we can go ahead to the next slide. Um, I'm just gonna tell you the answers. Uh, we don't have time to really mess around. So I'm gonna tell you what our answers are to those three questions. And then I'm gonna spend the rest of my talk defending those answers with, with data. Okay, so the first answer, what's been going on, there's actually been an uptick in prejudice reduction research. And some of these studies are just, classics and some of the people on this panel have produced them um, and some maybe some people on the call um, I, i'm excited to call you out when i say classics i don't mean you should teach these in a prejudice reduction class i think you should teach these in intro psychology classes their methods are tight um, their uh, their measurement is inspired and creative um, the theories that they're going after are important okay and they're doing it in important spaces as well so the next uh answer the modal research is very different from these future classics. Now, you know, that's partly definitionally, right? I'm already telling you these people are outliers, um, but there's reasons to worry about the mode and in fact, the majority. So if we go to the next point, um, there are many reasons not to trust the majority of the research. And what I'm especially concerned about is that some of our most dearly beloved prejudice reductions ideas are not well supported in the last dozen years of research, okay? And if we go on to the next one, um, I think the most damning, the most worrisome is that the most rigorous research in this meta-analysis is showing the smallest reductions in prejudice. Okay, so if we go on to the next, this all leads us to ask, and we do this when we do so in the paper, well, what should the next generation of prejudice reduction research look like? I don't know if I have the stamina to do this a third time, but if I do, uh, what, what do I want to see in that, you know, third review a dozen years from now, or maybe one of you will do that, that review. Um, and so that's, you know, this is a still a, a empirically generated uh, impression that we want to leave you with. But in the next slide, what I'd like to then end on is real editorializing. Um, uh, this is not empirically generated. This is just us wondering, are we even using the right model of change, right? So if we tightened up our methods, went after, you know, all the best designs in the best places, um, what would we find? And so um, we have some suggestions of that from our data, um, but then we, we also have some suggestions about where to go from here. Okay, so let's go on. All right, so first, support for uh, this claim that there has been an uptick in prejudice reduction research. You can go on to the figure. There's an increase in most types uh, of prejudice uh, reduction research. Now, this is broken down by methodology. Um, you remember that we were calling for more field experiments. Well, there's field experiments toggling al along there at the bottom in, in orange. It's not nothing, uh, but it's about one to three field experiments per year. Um, that black line on top is just the total number, the count of, of um, all experiments on prejudice reduction. Um, and you can see that's driven um, you know, by, by lab experimentation and then uh, of it, you know, halfway through this last uh, dozen years or so uh, by online research. So if we go on to the next one, um, I just wanna show you here the PRISMA chart that we put together. This is really just to say, where did we get these data? Well, we're using uh, biomedical meta-analytic standards. It's a pretty plain vanilla um, random effects meta-analysis, very straightforward, but we tried to make it fully replicable. I think we did make it fully replicable. So you can see at what point that we threw out records and what were our decision points. Um, but we also have all of our code and our data up on Dataverse. And so if you have any further questions about how to cut up these data, um, you can go there and, and do so yourself. So we can go on to the next slide. Um, how did we go about collecting all of the records? Um, we searched five separate databases, four are publicly available. One is uh, proprietary to Princeton University. It was a text-based text -based, uh, search, but we do also include our search terms from that text-based search online. We got 16,000 non-unique results and spent a glorious summer reviewing them all uh, with a group of um, master's level minimum RAs, paid RAs. We narrowed them down to about 1,800 using this criteria of prejudice as animus, right? So it could be emotion, it could be behavior, it could be norms, attitudes, beliefs, um, it had to be a negative um, orientation toward an outgroup. We did not include sexism, primarily for historical reasons, but also I can tell you more about why if you're concerned about that. We didn't do so in the first review, and these are really non-overlapping um, literatures, which is interesting. Um, we also didn't uh, go for uh, partisan bias or, or um, uh, 
or uh, you know, um, effective bias, um, negative partisan bias. Um, this is a growing literature, so keep your eye on that, but we, we, we didn't cover it in this particular review. We also aren't going to tell you about how to reduce pre uh, prejudice between um, Ohio State and Michigan fans. Um, and then finally, it had to be experimental. So we get this final sample. And in the next uh, bullet point, um, I'm just going to explain to you that um, we coded them for uh, their Ds. So we got um, we collected up to five um, effect sizes from each study that we um, that we averaged, and then averaged their estimated sampling uh, variance. We also coded qualitatively about you know what kinds of theories they were covering and so forth. I want to pause here and say that you know if we were on Instagram, this meta analysis would be just the most generous filter that you could give to this literature. Why am I saying that? It's because what we decided, there's often more than five outcomes per study, right? And so we decided we would let the authors tell us what were the most important outcomes. So we went to their abstracts and we said, okay, what do you want to say are the most important outcomes of the study? Of course, you know, we've all written papers. We know you want to show your best side, um, you know, in your abstract. And so um, I, I think this is the most generous view of this literature. Um, we had a couple of restrictions. So for example, we would always scoop up a D if it had to do with implicit bias or with behavior so that we could absolutely cover all cases in which those two things are being measured. We always uh, scooped up Ds with respect to longitudinal um, analyses as well. Okay, so we move on. Sorry, I'm, 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 can I ask a question? Yes, please, yeah. So, so I, I, your characterization of that is generous. I, I largely would, would, would hold that one one question I guess I would have is that for if a researcher has a sort of amb ambitions that vary in their studies, they say ideally we will solve uh, we will eliminate all prejudice and all behaviors everywhere. Our backup option is that we're going to show reduction in behavior on this on some button pushing task associated with prejudice, and our backup option beyond that is that we'll get changes on the thermometer measure. Mm -hmm. When they report them, the thermometer measure is functionally the, the most, basically picture them, each of those as being increasing in effect size. They will cut a filter off at the, at the, the, the effect that is, the, that is significant, but probably the smallest one. So they, if they don't get, we solved all the prejudice, they don't talk about it. Right. But if they get the, we got it on the button pushing task, they will. And so that is going to mean that you have a selection effect for, uh, significant but small effects. If you right. if if you're based on the abstract, so is there a chance that that collective pressure would push towards uh, a selection for the smallest effects observed in the study because they're trying to show you the coolest one, not the biggest one? Mm -hmm. I, I can absolutely see that theoretically that could work. I would say just in terms of reading through these abstracts. Um, their size was not as much considered as significance, right? Um, and you're gonna, we're gonna talk a lot about, uh, you know, size, effect size and significance a little bit later. Um, it's, but so I think that, um, you know, people often mention just, you know, qualitatively, I can say a, a lot of effect sizes like that. Um, but I, I can see how, how that dynamic would happen as well. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, um, so the next uh, point that I argued to you is that several of these prejudice reduction studies are just destined um, to be classics. Why? Well, first the interventions, they're robust, they're realistic. Um, and, and what I mean by robust is that they're, they're usually done with the populations of interest, right? They're not uh, proofs of concept. And so what they do is they really address not just the psychology, but also the social processes and, and sometimes even political processes involved in these interventions, which is absolutely, if you've ever run an intervention, what you need to consider. And it becomes part of this like extensive translation work, which we just shove into this black box of translation work, which actually ends up being like quite a bit of theoretical work when you bring an intervention from the lab into the field. So their packages, they've already done that. And so that's really um, encouraging. And then the second is robust methods. So large sample sizes, they measure behavior as well as attitudes, they have this sort of functional interdependence assessment going on, they attend to randomization, there's always some attrition, and you know, they don't just test 
for you know equivalence of treatment and control following attrition. They handle it correctly, econometrically. Um, they pre-register and they have open data. Okay. Um, so here's a really interesting thing. This group of studies that we um, that, that really sort of meet these two broad buckets of criteria, they actually address very varied theoretical approaches. Um, however, the thing they all have in common is that they report promising positive, uh, but limited or small um, uh, outcomes. Okay, so I'm going to tell you about a few of them. Um, grouping two together here. Um, and by the way, I also want to say that almost all of these studies were led by doctoral students. So two takes on that. One is, you know, tenured faculty, what are we doing? Uh, two is the future is incredibly bright, including Edward here on the panel is, is one of the studies I've, I've pulled out. Um, and I always pull out, it's not just for you today, Edward. Um, so the first one uh, attacks this question of contact. And, you know, uh, Don and Seth, Green, uh, no relation, and I have previously done a meta-analysis of just focusing on contact and, and um, arguing that we know a lot less about the effects of intergroup contact than we think we do. And so these two incredibly brave studies um, went after this idea of does intergroup contact lower prejudice by not just testing the, the main question, but also testing some of the conditions of contact, which is very rare to test. They did so in the arenas of sports. So um, Matt Lowe uh, went to India and tested um, intergroup contact between men of high caste and men of low caste in the context of a cricket uh, um, game, a cricket league, excuse me, um, that was ongoing across several months. Um, and uh, the, the randomization was that um, low caste men were either randomized onto your team or onto an opposing team. So there's contact throughout, but now the condition is, are you cooperating or not toward this common goal? Um, Sama Musa did much the same um, in Northern Iraq, uh, where a um, Christian uh, soccer league um, was integrated um, randomly with Muslim players, local Muslim players. And, um, both of these studies had incredibly um, creative, fascinating measurements. So um, behavioral effects such as um, in, in India, Matt Lowe um, distributed, um, essentially set up a, a marketplace and all players got um, nice sandals, but they were mismatched. And so he looks to see, will you penalize yourself in terms of trading with other players? Will you trade less efficiently by avoiding uh, members of low caste groups to try to trade uh, for the correct uh, matching sandal. Um, in uh, Iraq, um, Sama Musa gave uh, Christian players um, gift certificates to go eat at uh, Muslim restaurants and you know saw whether or not they were validated. Um, she also did something which I found really um, helpful by you know measuring things that are kind of outside of the bounds of typical ideas about what contact can do. So looking at policy attitudes to see whether there are downstream effects on you know things that we care about. Um, they all have uh, open data, pre-registration, and, and so forth. So we can go ahead. Um, the next uh, one I want to highlight is from Kevin Munger, who um, did this study at the time when I think awareness of Twitter bots was a little bit lower. So this is a more elegant study than you would, you would imagine, you know, now using our uh, 2022 vision. Um, the, the theory being tested here is one of uh, confrontation. So, you know, do does confrontation in the face of um, a, a racist comment, uh, reduce essentially recidivism. Does it does it reduce the expression of, of racial prejudice? And in this case, Kevin built a sample of people who were self-identifying as white men on Twitter through their avatars, um, who had just used a racist slur, the N word, in the past few weeks. And you know, he's tracking them. And now each one of these people who had actually used that racist slur in in the real context of of, of Twitter. Um, they were addressed by um, this uh, two by two design, one of the Twitter bots that uh, Kevin had designed, um, who were designed to either appear as black or white men by their by their avatars and as high versus low status, which is operationalized by how many uh, Twitter followers they had. And those bots were then randomly assigned to, to one of these men and they would confront them about you know why they shouldn't use that term. And then Kevin has the ability to just track whether they use it again over the course of you know many many weeks um, and it's and it's a behavioral outcome again um, open data pre-registration um, and so forth 
And then the, the last one, so Edward's study on um, online diversity training, um, you know, I'm gonna talk about diversity training later, but I'll preview for you that this is one of the only diversity training studies that's been done with a field experiment, evaluated with a field experiment in the last dozen years. One of the things I absolutely love about this study is first of all, it's a huge sample. And so it's one of the only out there that can actually uh, in a powered way test for heterogeneous effects. And they find the kind of heterogeneous effects that we indeed worry about, um, which is that the effects of this online training were concentrated among women and um, employees of color. So they're the ones who are actually um, some in, in many ways taking up the call of this diversity training and, and reacting uh, positively to it. Um, one of the ways that they assessed reacting positively, and this is the other really brave thing that this experiment did, in my understanding, um, uh, Edward, but feel free to correct me, um, there weren't uh, administrative data lying around for you to scoop up, or at least the ones that the lawyers would let you scoop up to assess uh, behavioral effects. And so what you all did was actually create a program a uh, mentoring, you know, taking someone out to coffee program yourselves and then tracked participation in this program so that you could actually measure behavior. Um, so, yeah, I mean, again, uh, just wonderful creativity, um, incredible work and um, and uh, produce some really sobering effects. Okay. Okay, so um, that's my point about the future classics. There are more, please read the paper for them. They, they deserve to be celebrated and integrated into your syllabi. The modal type of research is very different. Let me first tell you about what it looks like. So um, this is just the, the qualitative coding of what uh, approaches these studies were taking. And I wanna just review this so that you know what, where the preponderance of interest has, has been in um, you know, all of the social and biomedical sciences in terms of prejudice reduction in the last dozen years. The first um, category they are taking up a third of all activity, I have to say, didn't even exist the last time we did this review. This is extended and imaginary and imagined contact, I should say imagined contact. Um, and uh, it sort of tells you about the state of the contact literature that now, you know, theorists have kind of decided um, it, it's not even worth it to study face-to-face -face contact to a certain extent. We can just move on. We've, we've sort of covered that. And now we can move on to what are the effects of knowing that a friend has had contact with an outgroup member, or what are the effects of conjuring up an outgroup member in your head and imagining interactions with that, that outgroup member? What are the prejudice reduction effects there? Um, the next most uh, frequent um, investigation had to do with this you know, sort of umbrella term that we're using to, to uh, talk about cognitive and emotional training. And so this is um, any kind of intervention that taught you, for example, to regulate um, cognitions, you know, trying to speed up or slow down system one, system two, um, and indeed emotions too. How do you regulate, um, you know, the guilt or the fear that you feel around outgroup members? And then the third most populous was social categorization. Um, you all remember this from, you know, Psych 101, where you're taught to redraw lines. So are we a superordinate category? Can we join these groups together and make this outgroup feel more like an in-group? Okay, so if you go on to the next- um, interrupt for a second and yeah. ask a question. Um, you can always postpone if you're going to get to this, but you talk about this, this growth of this extended or imagined contact as an intervention. Do you have any hypotheses about why it became so popular? Do you think it's, it's like a function of the sorts of research that social psychologists were doing broadly, or is it that people just became so confident in the benefits of intergroup contact that they wanted to, like, do you guys have, like, why do you think that this became so popular so suddenly when it wasn't even something in your original review? Well, um, you know, there was another extremely influential meta-analysis, one of the most highly cited meta-analyses in all of psychology on contact written by Tom Pettigrew and Linda Tropp. And that, that meta-analysis's conclusions were essentially that, you know, um, contact works and that it doesn't even matter what, um, what conditions, you know, so uh, that Allport was essentially um, you know, sort of not necessary in that theorizing, that it, it's working under all these kinds of conditions. So I think it, it became more difficult to publish studies about face-to-face -face contact, um, given that this was seen as a sewn-up literature. And then simultaneously, you know, methodologically, the field was moving online and, you know, it wasn't the age of Zoom yet. And it became more, you know, difficult to study face-to-face -face contact in, uh, and keep up with the rate of publication that was demanded by, you know, the, the online pace. And so I think both of the things that you say are absolutely accurate. Um, yeah. 
Yeah. And, uh, and that kind of goes exactly to my point. So thanks for that, because on the next slide, you know, the way I want to characterize the literature at this point is that it's prejudice reduction through mentalizing, right? So when I was talking about, you know, those, those rich interventions that consider social processes and even political processes, that's really not part of the majority of the literature right now. It, those first three main categories, you know, um, imagining contact, you know, regulating your internal states, uh, whether they're cogn cognitive or, or emotional, and and redrawing, you know, sort of the, the boundaries of groups, that's all mental life, right? Um, and so these, these interventions aren't really dealing with these other features of um, intergroup interaction or politics or, you know, uh, context and authority. Um, very related second point is that we had this code that we used that's you know a bit of policy jargon but we defined it very um clearly so we defined we we, we coded a study as light touch if it was both um brief meaning 15 minutes or or, or less uh cheap and easy to implement if you met those three conditions of all of them you got the code light touch that was 76 percent of all of our studies and that's you know double coded checked discussion etc um Okay, and then finally, you know, the other way, and, and you kind of anticipated I was going to get to this complaint, the, the other way that you can characterize the modal research is that there's a lot of methodological problems. So very small sample sizes, there's a lot of attrition that's not being handled. Um, there's a cluster randomization, but then naive analysis of, of individual subjects without taking into account their correlated error, and an overall lack of transparency, even in the later years when you would expect more transparency to come online, um, because, you know, we're going back dozen years and so for some of those earlier studies it's it just really wasn't you know that widespread posting your data in in some of the fields where this work was being done um but we don't see like a general move toward more transparency or enough transparency in this field in general okay, so let's great. go on uh, yeah uh, Elizabeth. clarification question on the light touch because to me that's um that's shocking and probably tells us more about why we would expect a 15-minute intervention to work um have you thought about are these all one-time interventions or have you thought about frequency or timing uh, in, in definition of light touch? Yeah, that's, that's, a great, that's a great point. I mean, in, in part, this is kind of like a philosophical question, right? Because I think a lot of these studies are proofs of concept. And so, you know, maybe they're intended to be uh, scalable and accumulative, right? So um, if we have a light touch intervention where I text you to try to get you to stop in the middle of the day and, and picture this, you know, pleasant interaction with a black person, right? Um, maybe we could do that every day. One thing I'm going to show you is that that's actually not what's being tested, though. Um, so what's 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 being tested is the is the single proof of concept uh, moment. Yeah. Do you have any sense of how these sorts of things would compare to other literatures? So this looks all very damning to the prejudice reduction literature, but is this very different from any other sort of literature in social psychology? Great, but let's think about like what that would be. So, what what other literature and social psychology is so interventionist? I want to I want to you know sort of try to compare apples to apples. Um, well, I mean, like you can think about like habit for me. So, I mean, my advisor Katie Milkman does yeah. lots of research, about, like getting people to like get flu shots or yeah. go to the gym. Like, are are I, I guess to what extent do we think that these are just characteristic of social psychology broadly in this time period mm -hmm. versus mm -hmm. specific? Which, which maybe it's that given that prejudice reduction is so interventionist, it's so policy focused that we should have it kind of different standards or different uh, evaluation metrics, but, or is this just kind of like characteristic of the literature broadly? Well, I think in part because of your, you know, your PhD labs influence, like the, the habit formation literature looks better, right? I mean, you all have been, you know, doing uh, a lot of um, larger scale research you know outside of the lab uh you know excellent rigorous research and so that 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 field may look better uh, although you know i i haven't read a meta-analysis of that field um yeah i'd be curious what you all think about this actually i i think you know my impression is that um a lot of the uh ills that befall this literature are characteristic like you you recognize them right it's like everybody's moving online at a certain point you know you can just watch that time series um, and so that's going to affect, um, you know, everyone. I do want to say, though, that this isn't just the psychology literature, right? So this is social sciences more, more broadly. So there might be something about this field, too. And I'll, I'll name a couple. One is that, you know, this becomes a very litigious area to work in if you want to do it with, 
corporations and, and doing field research on, on prejudice is hard, right? Um, a lot of people don't want to know that their interventions are not working. Um, and so there are some things that are characteristic of this field, um, but others I can absolutely see as trends. But I don't know if any of you else, any, especially as we keep going and I, I show you some of the results, if um, they remind you of average results that we find in other areas, I'd, I'd love to know it. I think that's a fantastic I mean, I, point of reference. I can't think of a single literature that <clears throat> where the modal study routinely gets changes on behavior after the treatment's removed. Can you think of a literature, but, but are, are other literatures routinely measuring behavior? Because I want to get to that in a second. That's part of the problem here is that we don't even know. Um, I think that, you know, a lot of times behavior is just not being measured. There, there isn't that kind of broader like behavioral public policy literature. So I'm thinking about just the take up literature. How do we get people to do a thing um, on, on the public policy front? Um, those are when done by governments, almost all light touch interventions. But I think what's curious is in that literature, the expectation is that you're not changing people's mental models or doing any of what you call mentalizing. The expectation is we can't move that. So we're gonna you know, make it easier for you to sign up for you know, uh, the EITC or whatever the case may be. To me, the, the, the contrast here is really interesting, which is we are both using super light interventions, but we think the mechanism is changing people's minds. And that's not what we see in the take up um, literature, even though we do measure behavior on light touch interventions. That's really interesting. That's really interesting. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we're not gonna choice architecture our way out of prejudice, I would say. That's a good thing to just state outright, yeah. Um, okay, so let's let's move on and let, we should circle back to this. You know, here here's just like other ways to characterize, you know, the, the research. So you get a sense of like what's in there when I talk about the mode. So we're still doing a lot of measurement of explicit attitudes or beliefs or behavioral intentions. So just a ton of self-report. Um, types of prejudice, uh, race and ethnicity still leads, and I think appropriately. Um, ability is has always been a, a really interesting category. I think because there are just a lot of dedicated researchers um, doing you know good work trying to figure out um, how to integrate uh, populations, especially in schools um, and so forth. Um, and then a, a new category as compared to last time, and you know why for history's sake is immigration, uh, asylum seekers and refugees. So a prejudice against those groups, that's, that's a newer category um, in the past dozen years. And then, you know, we're still doing most of this in college settings and on MTurk. MTurk is new. Um, okay, what's the average effect? It's D equals 0.357, standard error of 0.02. Um, what does that mean? So let's take one of our most popular, um, uh, you know, self-reports, the feeling thermometer. Um, so if uh, zero is cold toward an outgroup and 100 is very warm, you can go one step forward. Um, let's take someone who's just got a mild prejudice, let's call it that, you know, so 10 points below uh, the neutral mark. Um, this would, after one treatment on average, move them to a 48. Um, not a bad deal, right? I mean, it's positive, really. First, that's the that's the first check, um, you know. And we know that the the preponderance of these studies are pretty light touch, and so moving up eight points, that actually that doesn't sound too bad, right? Um, now, what we want to do, I, I should mention first of all that this um, meta analysis is robust to a, a bunch of different specifications, and we have those in our um, in our supplementary analysis. Um, I'm just going to do one more uh, analysis to see if this D is robust to that analysis. And it's the most basic hands above the table one that we could possibly do. You can't argue with me about it because it involves no judgment. We're just gonna split up the sample uh, into quintiles by sample size. So sample size in the treatment, okay? So if you just go down one more, um, this table is just showing you the quintiles. So first of all, let's just consider the quintiles, right? The lowest quintile, there's 25 or fewer people in the treatment group. That already is like the warning bell. Um, the highest quintile is 78 or more. Okay. Um, now we got to go look and see whether the effect size tracks. And unfortunately, it does. And it tracks exactly in a beautiful pattern uh, suggestive of, um, of publication bias in which these tiny little studies with uh, big standard errors need to find these huge effect sizes, almost double what the average effect is, and that, you know, in a linear 
uh, way goes down um, as you as you look to the larger studies. So if you advance one more slide, Leif, that you know, just for um, everybody who likes to see it in pictures, there it is. It's just almost monotonic, right? Um, so if you advance one more, let's just translate that um, effect size, that average effect from the top quintile of samples of uh, sample size. That's a D of 0.18. That would now move us from a 40 to a 44. So this is, you know, no other weightings, no other judgments, just, you know, taking a look at, at sample size. Um, it's, it's, again, not a bad message, right? Like if, uh, if we were just to focus on that quintile, it's still moving us in a positive direction. We know these are tiny, you know, small or short studies. So it's, it's worth pausing to consider, well, are we dissatisfied, right? Um, so we can go on uh, one more. Here, I just want to show you that this isn't being driven by one particular um, area. It's also not specific to methodology. Some people like to ask me about that, like whether, you know, is this being driven by field studies or, or lab studies? It's not. We find the same, um, uh, the same pattern when you restrict um, to the top quintile. Um, this is just the different coatings of the literature in their different, um, in their different approaches. Um, and then if you advance one slide, this is uh, showing you the movement toward uh, a zero effect um, when you restrict the top quintile. Okay, so that's a lot of movement. Um, one thing that's nice about showing this figure as you restrict to the top quintile of sample size is we are just putting in there the ends for um, each type of uh, study approach, how many studies are represented in that category. And if you let your eyes fall all the way down to the bottom of the, the y-axis, you see that now we're only left with two studies of diversity training, and one is Edwards. I already told you about it, <laughs> okay? So this leads me to the next conclusion, if you go to the next slide, um, which is that some of the most popular prejudice reduction ideas are not supported. And if you just step back and think about what happens in this country after any kind of racial uh, religious, ethnically biased event, what happens, wh what do we call for? It's a diversity training. And what I'm telling you is in the last dozen years, we have exactly two studies, uh, experimental studies looking at the causal effects of a diversity training, okay? So it's just really important to say, because I'll start repeating it now, this is an absence of evidence. It's not evidence of absence, right? And we know that these interventions are going to go on. No one is going to skid in their tracks in response to me shouting about this. These, these will go on. And so the importance of actually getting some evidence on this, you know, I, I think has never been uh, more apparent. Um, Interestingly, um, so implicit bias trainings are included in that category, and, and that is a growing literature as well. There's a group of, and in fact, a, a study was just posted on the archive the other day about a, um, a long-term follow-up of an implicit bias training, and so this, this continues to grow, and it's very important to track. One thing I just want to point out, though, is that one thing that we were interested in, I told you that we were always going to take effect sizes um, that involved implicit bias, so no matter the kind of intervention. So we were interested in just does any kind of intervention out there change implicit bias? There have been other excellent meta-analyses done on the malleability of implicit bias. Um, but here we're just asking, what do we know first about um, whether implicit bias is changed by any intervention? And does that correspond in any way to behavior change? And again, I have to say there's such an absence of evidence. Um, that, again, there were only two studies that actually measured both implicit bias and a behavior as an outcome. So we have nothing to say about the functional interdependence of implicit bias and behavior conditional on any intervention that has been studied in the past dozen years. And then the other thing that I really wanna talk about, because this is a really popular idea in psychology and we had our eye on it when we started the meta-analysis and, and pre-registered this idea is, do we have any evidence um, about small changes building over time? So the sort of recursive um, effects idea. Um, and uh, this is one that's super important if your study is going to be light touch and have a small effect, right? So is it worth doing first of all, because you um, might repeat it. That's one way to ask this question. But this idea is really, it's just a small effect, but it can grow over time. There are you know, sort of supportive processes that are put in motion. Maybe it's cognitive dissonance, maybe it's a small behavior change, and then you wanna bring your attitudes in line. Um, again, it's just a, it's a, 
in this literature, I can say it's a theory without evidence, right? It's We don't have evidence against it, but there are so few studies that measure long-term effects that, that we can't assess the, um, uh, the validity of this, of this claim. So we should refrain from using it for now, uh, and we should treat it as a testable hypothesis. Okay, so let's go on. This is really my once more with feeling graph. You know this figure already, um, but what I'm just gonna do here is fit a regression line to it. Um, I'm plotting um, the D um, of every, the average D for every study. So this is all of the effects within each study averaged um, in, in the meta-analysis against the standard error. You see there are some outliers. I'm just showing you all the studies. If I remove those outliers, the, the, the line tells the same story. Um, what this uh, regression line suggests to me um, is that if we were to only listen to all the methodological complaints in this talk and say, okay, for the next dozen years, we're going to keep doing the same thing, but we're going to do it with really large samples, we're going to take care of our attrition, we're going to, um, you know, pre-register and, and use open data, et cetera, et cetera. What this reg regression line suggests to me with assumptions is that uh, what we would find is that all of these dots would just start moving towards zero. And indeed, this line crosses zero at some point, suggesting that if we were just going to use the same model of prejudice reduction with much better methods, we wouldn't find that we're that our efforts are adding up to much. And this, to me, is the most depressing conclusion um, of, of the meta-analysis. OK, um, so and on that topic, on that note, what should the next generation of prejudice reduction research look like? If you want to just open up this slide, I mean, we have a lot of recommendations, both for people interested in field research and in pe for people interested in lab research. We think that lab research is absolutely important for R&D and, and, um, and so forth. And so we, we put out a lot of suggestions, sort of open questions on important theories and so forth. And we have all of that in the paper. I wanna talk about another suggestion that we have, and this is the editorial uh, part of, the, of our time together, which you should absolutely you know, interrupt me and, and challenge me on, um, which is just thinking about different models of change um, and thinking more about intervening in structures, thinking more about a, a different direction of attack uh, for prejudice. So if we go forward, um, uh, our current model of change, and this is among you know, researchers who I know personally, who, you know, would never say that psychology, that um, prejudice is just a psychological problem. They would say it's a structural problem. But what the literature looks like is that we think of prejudice as a psychological problem um, for, for individuals. And so we attack it with individualized psychological interventions in order to create that individual change. And then we hope that that will um, trickle up to, to societal change. So an alternative model of change is to attack a psychological problem. Just let's we'll just keep it at the psychology. We'll still be concerned with mental life, but attack it with more structural interventions, more top-down interventions in order to create individual psychological and societal change. If we go to the next slide. Um, what is meant by that? That's a very loose term these days, and, and you know, indeed a very popular one. It's become pretty baggy, I think. Um, so we we definitely mean what most people mean by structure, so institutions and rules and leaders, it would be great if psychologists could get into the business of studying more of this kind of organizational change, you know, um, uh, edicts from our, our rulers and, and so on and so forth. But the other thing we mean by structure, which is the next part of this slide, is um, uh, more about social structure, right? And so more about um, the kind of, you know, the the, institutional structure is about these official levers that really change our collective experience. These are the unofficial levers that change our collective experience. So the ways in which we perceive the mass public or the, we perceive very important reference groups, um, the events that, that inform us of this, um, the ongoing sort of informal groupings. And my um, Chelsea Clark was saying, you know, what about black Twitter? There's no official board there, but you know, it's, it's been a, a, a mass force that's been guiding culture and public opinion, you know, over the last um, many years. And so this is a, sort of an idea of like a social structure, right? Um, and so how would this come into play in our interventions? Um, if we go on to the next slide, um, it's tough, I, I would say, because I don't want to throw out psychological theory, which is about our mental life, right? But we have a lot of theories in which we make predictions about how we perceive social structure and, and how that impacts us. And so I, the, the basic message is that I think we should get better at um, using our theory 
um, to um, uh, to make predictions about how structure will change our psychologies. Some theories are, are easier, right? So, so here's an example of, you know, social norms theory actually has really explicit predictions about, you know, leadership and how that can signal new social norms. And then there are just different expressions of that theory. So I wanted to give examples. I mean, in my lab right now, we're really trying to understand um, whether and to what extent there are psychological changes in response to Supreme Court decisions, right? Which, which you know, come part and parcel with your perception of the mass media that's surrounding it, uh, right? But of course, you could you could test this theory with a different way, which is just to send emails to people reminding them, you know, of, of the progressive orientation of their leader. Both are legitimate tests of this theory. But what I'm trying to suggest is that our, our, our tests right now really focus on that second bullet point on these really individualistic expressions and, and, and interventions as realized through individualistic means. Um, so if you go on to the next part of this slide, um, what becomes harder is that we also have a lot of individually oriented theories, theories that don't make predictions about anything, you know, that is recognizably structural. Um, so perspective taking theory is a really um, sort of surgent theory in um, prejudice reduction right now. A lot of people are, are um, taking note of some recent excellent studies showing um, uh, so showing uh, the um, some efficacious um, interventions. And so, oh, sorry, David's name is misspelled here, but I know a lot of us on the call know about um, uh, David Brockman and Josh Callis canvassing interventions where um, perspective giving is, um, is used. I want to say a note about why I think of this um, intervention as a more structural intervention, a more social structural intervention. Um, this differs than other kinds of interventions where um, we see this in our in our database, where you know people are asked on an individual level to you know simulate um, perspectives or to have conversations with others. Um, their their canvassing intervention is done um, in which. You know, people canvassers are knocking on the door of people's homes, um, and they initiate these conversations, which you know, in the end, are dyadic or triadic conversations um, about, for example, um, transgender rights or um, you know, expanding uh, rights to abortion. Um, what st strikes me as structural about it is that when you answer the door to one of these canvassers, you're aware that these canvassers. Um, are not just knocking on your door, they're knocking on everyone in your neighborhood's door, right? It's, 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 it's turning into a collective experience. You know that this is happening elsewhere. You also know that they're coming from a larger organization whose political purpose is to do this, right? And so um, the mind is aware of, you know, the many audiences for these messages and, and, and attendant to the conversation that you're having. And, and, and that's what I think is psychologically very different about those two um, sort of expressions and, and tests of this theory. Um, um, that's one, a, yeah, yeah. I, uh, this is David. Um, I, I did. I, so I like all this. Um, it, what it makes me think of is what Greg and I think are the, is like the key finding from the last decade and a half of wise interventions, <clears throat> which is that they depend on context, but more than that, they depend on like affordances in the context. So if you give someone a, a more beneficial construal of something that could promote a better behavior, they still need to find places in the context where they can act on that, where it can feel resonant, where it can feel locally valid and true. Um, and that's a, a finding from large multi-site trials where you treat individuals and then you look at heterogeneity across context and you find it's supportive context. So lots of evidence there. Yeah. That suggests addressing the constraints of individuals, but also addressing the, the affordances from people who have power over structures um, the, in which people are nested, right? So it sounds easy, but none of our research infrastructure is set up to do anything like that, right? And like, I feel like we could have picked almost any decade over the last six decades and say, we've forgotten Lewin's key point that the social group matters. Right, you don't just target the housewives individually and tell them to buy the cheap meats. You get them in a group and you do the democratic process. Like we've known that since the '30s, and no one does it. And it feels like it's because it's just so cheap and easy to run throwaway studies on inter or whatever else it is. And then, and then we kind of end up having to rely on super enterprising and ambitious doctoral students to go do things that are not the status quo because they have every incentive to wag their finger at the power structure and say you guys are doing the work all wrong. I mean, even, even the Brockman study, was, you know, they initially started as a graduate student with the LaCour scandal. So it feels like 
Like why, why, why is that how we've structured the way we're doing research on one of the most important topics in the world? That we have to rely on the enterprising nature of a few students at top PhD programs to invent new ways of doing research when, what, why don't we just make it easy for everybody to do the structural research that's actually gonna have a bigger effect? That's my, that's, you know, that's my main takeaway from your talk so far. Yeah, I love that. I have more things to say about that. And I, I like, I feel like that comment was like such a journey. I thought that you were going to talk about, you know, uh, construals, you know, being a legitimate target because then we could later on downstream target structure and this could be a two part process. I, I thought that's where you're yeah, going. No, it is that. Work. But but you can't test that unless you can also manipulate the context. Like I'm not satisfied yeah. with measuring the context. Yeah. You want to change it. Yeah. But then you've got the start, the, the clustering problem. Right. That's, that's if you want to hire, you want to address one manager, maybe they have 100 employees. You're the N of one that manager, you don't have N of 100. So the minute you care about multi level studies, the yeah. power problem is, is uh, exponentially worse. And yeah. that takes collaboration to recruit the multi level structure to have enough power at level two. 100%. And who can, who can, you know, muster that kind of collaboration? It's probably not a doctoral student. Right. And so I think that no. there are things that, you know, enterprising, graduate students, and I can say this as someone who tried to do it as a graduate student myself, you know, it's like there's a certain level you can reach, right? And after that, you're, you know, you kind of run out of capital in, in both social- It's and, exhausting. And I mean, financial. in education, we did a national study, but I had to fly to 65 schools. I like flew to Boise and rented a car and drove to Nyssa, Oregon. Like you can do that study once every five years. You, that, but that but can't think, be the but I think also, I think also yeah. one reason why is because we have such an individualistic, you know, um, fields, which is crazy for the kinds of questions that we want to answer, right? So, yeah. um, so one of my answers, and we should just go on to the next slide because I can I can finish and then and we can just talk about this is that you know we do need more collaborations. We need a truly more interdisciplinary science, right? If we're going to ask multi level multi level questions, then we need to answer, you know, run multi level studies. Um, and, and we're not the best at all of those kinds of skills, right? So um, I, I think that, you know, we, we need to improve our skills at thinking about the expressions of our theories to make them more structural, um, but then we're going to need other people to help, you know, build these studies, analyze these studies, right? Um, and if you go forward, um, I would say it, you know, I think we're at a moment right now where there's still such a push for equity reform that's justified by values. You know, we should we should you know restructure institutions um, because that's the just thing to do, and I think that's the right justification. But I think that you know we should also be studying those restructurings, and so it's it's creating sort of an interesting coalition of people who might not get on board because of the values, but might be really interested to to help with the you know evaluation of it all. Um, and we're going to need to know more causal identification strategies than, than um, you know, randomization into a two by two. And so I think that this also is the justification for more collaborations, right? Um, I, I think that um, there, you know, if we, I don't wanna end on saying, let's, let's you know, copy what the economists do, but, but one thing that they do is they're, um, they really take advantage of particular circumstances and, and they don't always have to jump in cars and, and drive around Boise, right? Um, and, and I think that a lot of economics has been actually moving into an interest in the structure, excuse me, the psychological effects of structural change, right? Um, both you know, in archival data sets, but also in natural experiments. And I think we need to get in there, right? I think we need to be looking to some of those, those spaces um, when, when leadership is rotated in you know, um, communities and, and, and organizations and, and what that does to our psychology and, and so forth. Um, yeah. So I, I, I'm, I'm totally with you. I, I think that it's, um, I think it's less impossible than, than we think, but, um, but it really is totally a reimagination of the structure no. of our field. I, I, it's just people have to prioritize it. But you know, Keith Maddox has a good comment that the incentive structure is wrong because in social psychology, you, you get to take credit for having had the insight just because you showed it in an imaginary scenario in an online sample. And you're like, this is an answered question now. But um, like, you know, in economics, a great contribution is to say, Somebody else tested this in a really weak way, and now we did the right study, and then now we know it. That's like AER. Um, and until that, we've kind of figured out the incentive structure for 
really testing the questions that matter with the DVs that matter and the populations that matter, then the 99% of people are going to keep doing the easy, low cost hypothetical online studies. And then we'll have to write reviews every 10 years wagging our finger at people. And like, I'm kind of like you, I've been writing that review for 10 years and I'm kind of tired of doing that. Feels like if, if we kind of pulled resources, I don't like, I'm not in a business school, so I don't really understand how it works, but I understand, but people tell me you have a budget for MTurk. Maybe you get $50,000 a year. How many business school press professors do we need to pay for a panel of managers, like a, like a, um, like a test like panel who are going to be in prejudice reduction studies, a nationally representative one, like 10? I, I don't know how many, but it just, it feels like that's a solvable problem if we care about really moving the needle on the outcomes and having a better science. But I, but, I, but there has to be will for it. And I'm not sure there is because psychology has never been a discipline that's cared about samples or real world behavior, at least not since the forties. I guess one, one thing also, like when you talk about structurally, like if, if we're, if the result of the meta-analysis of just like these individual like level interventions focus on psychological processes are maybe not where we should go, we should be thinking about structures. And then we also have all these like structural things about the field of social psychology and what it incentivizes. Like, does this mean that psychologists should not be doing prejudice reduction and we should leave it to like people who, who have fewer publishing like requirement, like economists where you can publish like a couple papers in the top places over your career and be rewarded for that. When like a psychologist, you can't get tenure at many top places publishing like just, just a couple papers. And so it's like, if it's not about the individual like, psychology as well as it's like the incentives in our field are not right does this mean that psychologists should not be doing this at all and we should leave it to the other fields in social science i mean i think that that's the question that we should ask in order to motivate people to start changing things right like is this is this a legitimate you know topic of study will we do a good enough job right or will we lead will we waste resources lead people astray but i think elizabeth you were about to say something yeah well, I was just gonna, maybe this is like um, an optimistic view of this, because I think there's, um, we can all be kind of really disappointed with this, but something that um, Luca says in the Q&A that I, that I agree with, which is like, from a policy perspective, wouldn't it have been great if it were true that you could do a light touch intervention that was at the individual level and actually get an outcome that matters? And so, you know, one thing that I heard from you, Betsy, and I don't want to lose, is that if if the current state of the field is not that we don't think those things work, but that we just don't have any good evidence of that. There is still, I think, some value for policymakers to rule out that these light touch things are not gonna solve the problem, right? And so I think at least from the policy perspective, there's a whole world of people who hope that you can solve prejudice with these light touch outcomes. And we have to make a definitive quantitatively rigorous case that that's not true before the political will that David is talking about emerges for something more substantive. Um, and so I think there's still value in, in that if we're not there yet, which it sounds like we're not. Uh, yeah, and I think that also many of these um, kinds of research enterprises are, are very good as basic research. Like we do wanna understand the mind and, and, and how it um, processes, you know, out groups and in groups and, um, and, and, and so I, I don't think that this is something to give up in psychology that was sort of more of like, a, should we threaten it uh, in order to start changing things? But, um, uh, you know, I, I, I do see Lucas's comment as well. And I just want to make clear, this is not just a psychology problem. This, this review went way beyond psychology. So we consider considered sociology and economic, and, you know, the, the um, cast paper, um, uh, in, in India is, is from economics. So um, this is just experimental. Like, what do we know causal inference wise, right? So, um, yeah, so. And I guess my answer is that, I don't know if anyone wants that, maybe people are leaving, but the, I, I can't imagine solving the problem without psychological science because so much of the way prejudice is experienced is in the subtle dynamics of interactions between people and in the ambiguities between what someone intends in an interaction and what's actually experienced. And economic theory doesn't deal with that and sociological theory doesn't usually except at a descriptive level. Um, and so I, I, I think our, our behavioral theories are gonna be essential to 
the kinds of mid-level day-to-day interactions between people who have power in a setting and people who afford less power in a setting. Um, but, but, but I think we're not, we're not yet asking research questions enough about those dyads, dyadic interactions in ways where we can give concrete policy advice based on causal studies. And so but, to me, it goes back to the absence of evidence point that there probably are short light touch things that can be done if we knew exactly which gatekeeper to target and what their barriers were, and we thought about the tension system and then had a precise and effective way of targeting it in a way that scaled. Yeah, and I just wanna also be clear, you know, ending on all of the landmark studies that we cover, the ones that are just so excellent, they're all testing theory that comes from psychology. They're all using measurements that come from psychology. Like I have no doubt actually about the role of psychology in this endeavor. Um, however, I do have doubts about, you know, whether it's, it, it, how it's gonna go if it's left all up to us to, to you know, you know, build the interventions and run the, the um, evaluations. And so what I don't want it to end up happening is that we just keep farming out theory and, and measurement to other fields who do that. Like, I would like it to be a collaborative process. And I think that one message to take away is like, let's not just export you know, ideas, let's let's collaborate on them because they change when you export them, right? And so I, I think we should follow the ideas and go into policy spaces and and um, and other science, social scientific spaces where, where this is, um, you know, going to be a, a more impactful exercise. That seems like a great point to end on. Thank you so much, Betsy. And thanks to all of our panelists for being here today. Really, really engaging discussion. Thanks to all of our audience, and uh, hopefully this will all be posted on YouTube so you can even share the whole experience with your friends. All right, everybody, enjoy your weekend, uh, and we'll see you next week.